Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. My name is Dakota Cohen and today on the show I'll be talking with Ben Falk. But before we dive into the conversation, I want to let you know about an event that we've got coming up on April 23rd, 24th, and 25th. So as you may know, uh, my colleagues Rob and Michelle Avis and I just finished writing our book, the Building Your Permaculture Property uh, book. It's a five-step process to design and develop land anywhere in the world. And to help us celebrate the launch of that book and also just to further permaculture as a movement, we are organizing a, um, an incredible event where we're bringing some of the, the best of the best in the, in the permaculture field, uh, folks like Jeff Lawton, Peter Bain, Starhawk, uh, Ben Falk, uh, Richard Perkins, Maura Gamble, Mark Shepard, Stefan Subkowiak, uh, Jack Spierko, uh, and many others. Uh, we're, we're bringing them all to, to one place for three days where they're, they're each going to be sharing their case studies about how they built their permaculture properties uh, and sharing some of their successes and failures and what their overall process was. So if this is interesting to you, uh, you can head over to uh, mypermacultureproperty.com uh, and you can register for the event. It, again, it's free, it's live, it's online. You can uh, There's going to be amazing door prizes. You can interact with uh, with the guests at the end of their presentations. Uh, you can we'll, we'll having about a, about uh, you know 30 or 40 minutes of Q and A which each with each of the guests. Uh, but if you can't make it to uh, the the entire event, or if you're hearing this about this this event, you know after the the date uh, of April 23rd, 24th, and 25th, 2021. Don't worry, uh, because we're recording the whole event, and uh, we're actually going to be making it available as part of a of a book bundle that uh, is going to help uh, keep uh, money away from uh, Jeff Bezos over at Amazon there, <laughs> and uh, so that if, if you guys buy the book from us, you'll be getting uh, the book as well as a bunch of other uh, uh, value instead of. Uh, like I said, giving uh, giving all your money over to to Bezos there, so um, a big thank you to uh, our publisher, who's who's also the main sponsor of the event, New Society Publishers. Uh, as as I mentioned, we're going to be giving out a ton of door prizes, uh, where you can win you know a copy of of, a, of basically all of the authors that are that are taking part in the event. Uh, we'll be doing door prizes of, of their books as well as a bunch of other you know coupon codes and and uh, a lot of other awesome stuff. So try to attend live, but like I said, if you can't make it, don't worry. Uh, we'll be recording the whole thing. And uh, but either way, the 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 site to go to is mypermacultureproperty.com, and you'll get all the info there. So without any further ado, let's jump into the conversation with uh, with Ben and I. Hey Ben, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for having me a part of it. So I'm, um, uh, I have a little kind of confession to make. Uh, I, I closed all my social media uh, accounts, you know, right at the beginning of this pandemic, except for YouTube. It's kind of the one that I stayed on. And to be honest, the only thing I miss about it are your posts <laughs> come up on uh, Instagram and, um, and Facebook and stuff like that. And so uh I'm just curious, like, what are what are some of the you know projects that you've got on the go right now? Yeah, well, that's funny. I'm, you know, I, I've heard that, and then I've heard you know that that those are the posts that people hate the most too. So that's funny. It, it, it <laughs> goes both ways. I don't think there's a lot of you know middle ground there for people. <laughs> 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 kind of stir the pot a bit, I guess. But um, let's see. The latest projects. I mean, well, now I'm just kind of you know today was a scramble to haul the last of a few logs I had on the ground in because we're about to have soft, we're losing our, our frost in the ground right now real rapidly. So uh, immediate project was to get the final bit of firewood in and that I can then process for next winter. Um, Cause everything's, yeah, we're losing our snow, losing the frozen ground and now we're sugaring. Everyone's height of sugar season here. And, um, and which is also beautiful skiing corn snow season. And then, we're move, we started our our onions and shallots yesterday, day before, and you know gardening's about to start. So um, I, I guess I'm ready for that. <laughs> but we like the winter, even though it's so long. I mean, it's nice to have the break um, from everything. But the then the days get so long, which is great. So you can do it. You can kind of keep up with it all. Um, I don't know, you know, we've got a lot of design projects, like the design business is busy, busier than it's ever been. Uh, so trying to keep up with those, there's a lot of COVID refugees moving to land and, you know, leave, people leaving <laughs> the cities. 
So those were always a large part of our projects to begin with. And so then that population just went straight up with, with COVID and cities becoming less desirable. And uh, so trying to keep up with the design business that Cornelius and I run and uh, we've hired, been hiring new employees. And um, But then I'm doing a lot of online consults, some site consults, but not traveling too much. And, um, you know, personally, just always trying to have a better veggie garden every year is my, <laughs> it's always on the mind. Like, you know, you get a new chance every year, which is cool on like with trees and stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm revising, I signed a revision contract for my book. So I got to buckle down and start or continue to write that. Um, it's not going to be a lot of writing, but another 20, 30% and a bunch yeah. of edits. So I got to do that. I mean, that's, you know, it'll be nice to have done, but it's not something, it's not the work itself. is not something I love, you know, being on the computer, but th- th- it will be good to, to get that out. Cause the other, the book itself now is like seven years or so. So there's a lot of greenhouse stuff and, and a lot of tools and maintenance aspects, which aren't in the book. Um, you know, more and more every year that goes on, it's like more about ma- maintenance, you know, management yeah. forever. So yeah design is design and installation i think are the easier parts you know the management is really where the rubber meets the road and um so i think the book will have a much heavier emphasis on management for sure just given that it's another seven years in now yeah yeah uh that's that's exciting stuff man yeah like your your book um the resilient farm and homestead uh as well as the permaculture skills dvd project that you Mm. were a part of um, those were actually, they came out kind of just when I was getting into, uh, permaculture and yeah, mm-hmm. they were invaluable resources for, um, you know, for my early years. Um, That's but, great uh, to hear. yeah. So like, I mean, uh, aside from the, you know, the, the management, you know, at the addition of, of the management to the, the new revisions of the book, is there anything else that you, um, kind of stuff you're going to be taking out or putting in? Yeah, I'm going to be taking out the only I need to take some stuff out because I can't make the book much, much longer um, because of the publisher's guidelines. And I think it's a good good not to make it much longer um, is some of the graphics and basically some of the plan graphics that that like landscape architecture students would would be about the only people particularly interested in those. Some of those I think are going to come out. Um which I think is fine. Most of the audience isn't, isn't those people. Um, and then, and maybe some of the grazing, gra- grazing tree planted areas was like a big part of where my headspace was at when I originally wrote the bulk of the book. And while I've continued with some of that, it's, yeah, there's a lot of space devoted to that. So maybe some of that will come out. Um, but mostly I have a longer list of things I want to add. I mean, the greenhouses is, a chapter on greenhouses and outdoor microclimates. Um, like get quite into, I, I'd like to get quite a deep dive on creating outdoor microclimates and what's involved with that and, and how to how to do that because it's just such a missing piece in the discussion and, and such a central piece to our design work in this climate. Um, also on tools and maintenance, it will be a big, it won't be a chapter, but it'll be woven in quite heavily and then they'll probably be like three to five new principles Mm -hmm. um movable everything is one of them i just actually (laughs) kind of crystallized the other day for me like the the more that can be movable on a site the better Uh, i aim into that that's (laughs) (laughs) like like put everything on skids if you can and yeah Yeah. you know everything on wheels if you can in a shot i've just moved in that direction more and more um yeah and there's some others be naked a lot more is, is another one. <laughs> I mean, I've always been in like into being outside without clothes on, I think. But uh, since the book was written, I've, it's become even more important. <laughs> and, uh, and, and hydrotherapy sauna, like that's been a big, bigger part of my life late, lately. Yeah. Um, it's okay. always, again, been a part, but it's been more of a part, you know, with the pandemic and everything yeah. too. So j- just for the record, for the folks that are listening to this only on podcast, Ben is wearing clothes right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, i'm not totally heating the principle at the moment but 
Um, so yeah, well, uh, that's I'm I'm curious. What's the uh, uh, why is why is that such an important principle for you? Just for health, um, and it, you know, like it just has it falls within like the rewilding aspect of like um, invigorating your own life and becoming closer to the sources of health more of which one is sunshine and, and bare feet on the touching the ground and uh, feeling the breeze and the sun, you know, just, just uh, the, the, all of that is like a rewilding and less domesticated, pre, you know, existence. You know, I think that's a, that's a big part of that. Absolutely. Um, and going in cold water, you know, like the hydro, on the on hydrotherapy pieces, another, and, you know, so many aspects fall into that, but yeah. Yeah, that one one uh, recommendation I'll give. Uh, I'm I'm also uh, I like to wear the least amount of clothes as possible in the summertime. And but uh, I got um, a set of noise canceling headphones uh, last oh, year, and it's been dangerous. like yeah, it's, it's, it is dangerous to wear those and be uh, right. <laughs> making. Totally. I've I've, I've uh, had a couple of visitors to the farm, and oh, uh, yeah. it's got a surprise when. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've like. I usually stay kind of in my zone one, you know, if I'm just in the garden and, and everything, I, I, it's great. You know, I walk out of the house and just start gardening, whatever, just doing my own thing. No one's really around, but sometimes I'll like run over to the barn to get a tool. And like, then the UPS guy comes up and I'm like jumping into a shed and yeah. <laughs> hiding there for a minute. Um, and then, yeah, some people don't care at all. I had a neighbor come over once. He's like, Oh, he's like, Oh, so and he's like, oh, don't worry. I don't mind. I'm like, good. I'm glad you don't mind. It. It's so fun. That's great. You know, so I don't mind either. But, it's yeah. funny. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think those are some big pieces. Um, there's some others too. I'm, I'm honestly, my head's so full of like just the sunshine that we had. It, today was just brilliant and the sap was flowing. And I was, I, I got a sawmill. So I'm milling a bunch of wood now. And I, I can't think of all the other aspects, but there's going to be a few others too um, in the book. I think the health piece is going to be, you know, it's in there pretty yeah. substantially right now, but it's going to be a bigger piece given um, the climate uh, in which the revisions being done and how um, yeah. I kind of, I mean, what's going on now in the world is somewhat unsurprising to me and it's somewhat unsurprising to some people, but it's pretty shocking to most people. And, I think um, there's a lot of uh, thoughts about that and kind of content on that front. I, uh, be... I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, like here in, here in Canada, I don't know if, it's, if, if it was like this in the States, but um, like our kind of health agency, Health Canada, at the beginning of this whole thing um, had like bulletins that they were, you know, part of their kind of propaganda around the whole thing um, was to put up bulletins uh, stating how uh, any any um, kind of um, belief that your diet could help kind of pr like improve your immune system was was wow. false, was false. I I couldn't That's believe so it. I, wild. Couldn't, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> they didn't even just they didn't even want that idea to float just for possible other benefits unrelated to no, COVID. No, it was just like God forbid we just like improve. Uh, you know. Yeah maybe just uh, diabetes or whatever else. <clears throat> well, I mean, just in, in the fact alone that, you know, most of the people that are like the vast majority of people that are being affected by this have, you know, several comorbidities. And so sure. how is, how does that, like, even if diet didn't play a role in, you know, boosting immune system, which is of course it does. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it is, it is really interesting how, um, how far gone that paradigm is. And, and I, yeah. I really, I really do, um, you know, I think your book was the first place I ever, I ever heard the term nutrient density. Mm -hmm. Um, and that also set me off on a whole you know path of my own, you know, learning about Weston A. Price and right, you know, right. all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a huge part that, that gets missed. Yeah. I mean, we are on that, on that piece. I mean, I think some things are being, um, revealed, but, but we are really, there's, this has been a big, um, push towards like a more a more of a dark ages of health like with like exactly what you're saying like yeah. suppressing information suppressing ideas about health um yeah and, and and experts who are sharing opinion of all you know getting deplatformed and getting censored and just uh, kind of su suppressing not just trying to suppress this virus but suppressing open discussion about health as a whole and and yeah. safety as a whole yeah, it's it's wild so yeah I, i'm gonna 
be kind of like looking at everything and through that lens to some extent um, in the revision. But yeah, it's, it's a cr- chilling times. It is. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, I mean, like you mentioned that you've seen a, like, I guess, have you, have you seen an uptick in, you know, the, the, the term you used was like COVID refugees. COVID <laughs> refugees, yeah. People, like, yeah. Our business for sure. Like we've never been busier in, in the work that yeah. we do as well. Yeah, I think people living the, leaving the cities and then also just the, the disruption of daily normal life that people had come to think was like immutable and reliable, realizing that it, that that none of those things are and they're all very vulnerable and very brittle, uh, just having whatever on the shelves at the stores and you name it. So, um, so anyone who had been thinking about like, oh, maybe that's a possibility. Maybe I should do something about how brittle things are for my own life. They just they didn't need more than this kick in the butt to be like, yeah. okay, yeah, now it's time to start the garden or close on that piece of land in the country or move to the place we have as like a, you know, summer place or or just to leave the city and and get it get a more rural place. A lot of people are being bumped out of you know, they maybe live near big cities and then the city people are bumping them out and they're bumping out up to where we are. Yeah. You know, it's just like in musical chairs. Yeah. It's, it's been really interesting to see kind of the, the different industries that have like just been thriving in with what's happened and the ones that have just absolutely cratered. And yeah. um, I think the, the, the most uh, surprising for me has been like recreational um, like vehicles, like, like selling dirt bikes and skidoos and holiday trailers mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Like they've just got, like, you can't buy them anymore in our area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's so, and it's, uh, yeah, it's odd what it is. It's kind of surreal. Cause especially with how economically damaging it is for, you know, a lot of people, I guess the stimulus payments, which are, crumbs in the united states for for what has been taken uh it seems it's odd i was in a town where i was going to stop in and have my son look at atvs because he just like likes to get on atvs and look at all the machines yeah, yeah. and we went in and like they had no atvs and i was like what's going on like you guys always have like 100 atvs here it's like oh we're gone like we we can't get any yeah. and they're all sold out it's like this is so weird like people are we're going to like hard times and like all the ATVs are sold out. <laughs> it's crazy. But although like one hopeful thing, um, we got a, an email just the other day from the company that we've been buying seats from for years. And uh, basically it was just kind of a, Hey, by the way, like, like we're, we're going to be kind of late on your seat order this year because in the past month they had sold more seeds than they did in any previous year on record. Yeah. In one oh yeah we we bought our seeds this year we essentially called the seed companies we always buy from we're like we want to put our order in you know it's the day you open we're going to put our order in we, yeah we did that because we knew yeah it's just getting that's a great thing to see for sure all the seed companies are doing great and people are gardening more you still can't get ball jars around here you know people Same not here. only garden but they put up food Same here. you know they kind of did it for real um to to a large extent it seems so yeah, there's a lot of benefits that are happening. Um, less travel. Yeah, the skies have been so so clear. You know, this year, I mean, the the air cleared up a lot. I feel like, and we're in a place without without it being too bad. I heard down in near the cities, it was like remarkable the difference. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I know people who like could see. Uh, lo- they could just look at Long Island from Connecticut. They never even really saw it before. They knew it was there. It was like eight miles. 12 50 miles away whatever and, and it's just like so clear that you just look right at it interesting yeah the, i mean the the like right kind of at the start of this um my brother was actually in the um he was in the hospital like right when they started locking stuff down he was in the emergency and uh, so i was like mm-hmm. driving up to like our major city edmonton here and like you know the main kind of it's called um, white ave it's like the main street of like Edmonton. like this is like a you know two million million and a half person city it was like empty <laughs> like yeah. like no matter what time i was going up every day for a week and there was nobody there it was it was freaky but that that stuff is um i was up the other day and i feel like the it's more or less kind of back to things as usual at least in the city oh interesting yeah yeah <laughs> this whole event you know it's so it's so surreal because it may I mean, I, I had more of a problem with normal than most people before yeah. this. And now <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm someone who wants, who's like rooting for normal a little bit. And when I'm like, I had 
about the biggest problem going with like normal. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah. weird, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> totally. Um, so when do you expect your, um, like the, the book to be out, like the, the new revisions? Um, I think not probably till late summer. Um, it just really takes it. it oh, there's a lot of back and forth. So yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's I was cool. hoping, I was thinking just jam on it and have it come out like in June, the way the original book did. Cause I think that'd be better in the early summer, but yeah, it's just, it's going to take a little time. So yeah, no, yeah. That's so, I, I was, I was thinking this was like a, a year or something away. That's, that's no, yeah. Gonna, <laughs> I have a lot of notes and so it should go pretty, you know, it's so much different than writing a book from scratch. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, can work in the manuscript that already has a structure and all of that. So, but yeah. probably, hopefully, well before in the next in the new year, uh, it'll be out. Yeah, nice. So, yeah. you've um, how many years are you have you been on um, the the property at Mad River now? So that's on? eight about eighteen. Yeah, almost twenty years. It's like I think eight. This might be year eighteen. I think I don't know. I'm so uh, bad with dates, but uh, yeah, it's it's, it's really deductive i mean the 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 tools now are saws pruners you know it, it's all removal i mean except for veggie you know veggie gardens always every year but there's not really much planting it's it's really cutting back you know it's it's management of the jungle you know it's much more of like a tropical permaculture you know like yeah like biomass harvesting versus and letting light like directing light to where it's to the yeah, yeah. The, the 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 trees and shrubs that need it the most um, versus putting much else in the ground. Little still adding of some nutrients to to get some oaks that have been slow down in the bottom, uh, but yeah, it's pretty pretty darn filled in for yeah. sure. So, are there are there any things that like you're kind of observing now? You know, almost two decades in that you like you just did not expect. It just kind of blew you away. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always lots of little learnings, but this last summer was a drought, the biggest drought we've had in yeah. a long time, really dry here for like the whole growing season. And that site does really well in that because it's just all we've been doing is holding the water back for 20 years almost. And, and it's been a lot, lot of it's a wet site to begin with. So like this, um, northern pecan that i planted maybe 12 years ago or something which barely has grown um maybe it grew from four feet to nine feet in eight years basically put on like an inch or two of growth a year maybe a little more a little less than that and i figured it was a hardiness thing like all right this i'm not planting i mean i haven't planted any more of it when i've watched how that's done it's like okay it's not dying but it's not thriving it's not going to do it and then this year grew like, like four feet or three feet, just like, like, like woke up, you know, like here's this plant that's all of a sudden behaving so differently. And I, I think it's just been bonsai stunted by the water, by the high water table and the air got into the soil. And this is what I think anyway. And just, it's not like I dumped a load of manure on it or anything like that it didn't really get any new care. And I think it's just been, you know, stunted by the water. So, it, it, you know, stuff like that's always totally surprising to see. Um, you can, you can have conclusions that are just totally wrong. Maybe like, Oh, this isn't that hardy. Then yeah. it, it probably, had, I think that might have nothing to do with the hardiness. It's just all to do with the water, you know? Yeah. I mean, some stuff that's so vigorous for some people, you know, every it's heavy clay soil. So, like we see a lot of things fail that other people have as almost like invasives, quote unquote. Like, I mean, I see like autumn olives, you know, sometimes just struggle to stay alive and then straight up die on that yeah. site. Yeah. <laughs> like everyone's like, oh, those are so, those are going to take over. I'm like, I'm trying to keep mine alive, you know, <laughs> and just there's so much site variation. And black locust is pretty wet hardy, it turns out <laughs> um, from what I'm seeing, which it's not supposed to be. Um, finally got some persimmons that have survived and are now getting pretty big in certain areas. Um, not much in the way of chestnuts happy there. Cause it's such a heavy, which is, that would be more expected. 
um, heavy, heavy soils. They don't like so much, it seems, but yeah, a lot of different, yeah, a lot of different stuff from, from, you know, and, but ultimately it's ma- management is the limiting factors. What I've just come to yeah. realize, like the more years that go in and, and, and also access. I mean, that site's tough access anyways, because it's steep and wet and bouldery. So I'm not sure how much of a better job I could have done, but I, I really, it makes me very, it, it's hard to get at a lot of that site with like more than a wheelbarrow pushing a wheelbarrow, which, you know, starts to limit how much wood chips you're going to get out to zone three or something like that. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, we have a second site we've been working on and, and I, it, it's just low angle and dry and I can like drive a load of chips in a truck wherever I want. And that's, you know, it's easy it's pretty mind blowing to see that you could have, you know, 20 acres, which takes less t- is easier to maintain plantings on 20 acres than plantings on three acres in a different. Just, yeah. Just, just from access. Uh, from access. Wow. Which then, and which is then undergirded by steepness of slope and wetness, which in this part of the world, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of steep, slopes and there's a lot of wet areas and yeah you start getting some of those acres and it's it's pretty primitive you know it's like carrying buckets and you know being ankle deep and you know like you're you're just you can't maintain as much you know as you can if you can drive a an atv in a trailer and someone's in the back of the trailer shoveling out chips or whatever you know you can just all of a sudden maintain so much more um so yeah that's a big one Interesting. So like apart from like the access, which I mean, it sounds like you, you know, you, you're kind of limited, like you said, based on slope and rockiness, was there anything else like in your, you know, original design that you, you felt like, ah, I, if I had one do over, you know, this is what I would have, I would have switched. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the biggest things are um, a lot of, of the bones of it are really great. I'm glad how close everything is together, which the site forced it, which is, is great. Like clustering things like the barn and the living space are 20 feet apart. It's awesome. The closer, the better um, with pretty much. Um, I'd say the biggest thing that I, that I could have done better. I mean, I couldn't have, cause I didn't know it then I had to be working with the site to learn it, but like all the Oaks, like the bottom three acres, which are like an oak savanna with some walnuts and this northern party pecan and a few other juglins and stuff like that. Um, but mostly swamp white oak and bur oak, yeah. especially swamp white. I didn't realize until like year eight that the that swamp white oaks would really do great down there, which and now it's very obvious, but they're like really thriving. And they also took some nitrogen like fish emulsion or some chicken manure or just some pro grow gasp you know like took me many years to ethically buy a bag i was just like we don't buy bags of pro grow this is permaculture and like now i realize like you know not doing that like stunted the whole like i could these there's 30 trees that could be way above deer brows and 20 feet tall 25 30 feet tall now that are like six feet tall because I didn't do certain things. And so, you know, some, some stuff could have just went way further ahead if I had prioritized basically planting that area with things that do well down there, like swamp white oak, especially, and getting them nitrogen. Interesting. You know? Big, yeah. big, big surprise, right? Like every yeah. tree grower, conventional tree grower knows yeah. that, but like, I mean, I, I once borrowed a skid steer bucket for my tractor and I dumped a full on yard of chips on each of these oaks one winter when the ground was frozen and I could really drive down there. And that maybe took these plants from growing two inches to like four inches. But then when I started bringing some fish emulsion down there and some pro grow, all of a sudden these stuff, these plants started growing, you know, 16 to 20 inches a year. And that doesn't take too long to get above deer brows and have like a sizable tree that way. But you're really on the slow track if you're going two inches a year. Yeah. And it was more of just an ethical, you know, ideological holdup of like, well, I, I don't want to buy that input. And it's like, okay, but then maybe half these trees are just going to get eaten down by deer and aren't going to survive. And you're just wasting your time versus like, hey, let's have the savanna go off. Yeah. 
So that's a big one. I think just getting around like ideological bl blocks, you know, and, and saying like, if you're going to establish the system, get it established or it's not really worth <laughs> anything, you know, if, if you're stunting it because of whatever, like in my instance, not wanting to back, buy a back program, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. I was actually thinking about this the other day because um, that's actually been one of our hangups on the farm here is like, is, uh, you know, we've been organic for, for 30 plus years. We've never used any, you know, fertilizers or anything like that um, or like you know, antibiotics or anything on the animals or the land for you know, over three decades. But um, <clears throat> we've also discovered that like nitrogen is kind of our weak link in like, you know, I've, um, I've taken, you know, the, our best, pa our worst pastures to our best pastures just by applying some compost and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, it's like, you know, the, like, I have no ethical hang up using fossil fuels. Like we have all kinds of tractors and, you know, we use, right. but like, there's this block of like, yeah, but using fertilizer is wrong. And so I was kind of thinking about that. And so it's, yeah, it's interesting. You bring it up. It's like, where totally. I mean, yeah, that is very similar. I mean, I'll, I'll go drive to go skiing 10, eight miles away that's probably one true one of those trips is probably five yeah. times the negative impact on the world than buying a bag of program maybe and it, but yeah. yeah it's just very these things are are that they're idi they're ideological you know? yeah well and I, especially like in terms of like when you look at nitrogen fertilizer like the embodied energy in that is basically equivalent to the embodied energy in you know gasoline or diesel like in terms like if mm. you're comparing pound to pound it's the right same. and right. so uh, as long as there's not any like negative side effects to, you know, the soil biology. Right. Uh, yeah. There really is no, if, if you drive, <laughs> right. You know, it's, you can't. Right. Say, and that's probably like your comparisons probably with like a straight up, like anhydrous ammonia type of thing. Right. Versus like some of this stuff, like program is great. And it's just made with, um, you know, there's, there's byproducts in there, you know, yeah. and stuff. So same yeah. with the fish emulsion. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's interesting. So, I mean, like kind of on, on that same thought, like, is there, any, is there something that you used to kind of believe about, you know, permaculture or, you know, homesteading or, you know, like that it was just, you know, uh, uh, you know ideological or, or dogmatic that you've mm -hmm. that you know, like no longer kind of cling to that anymore. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of things I, I write about some, some of them are in my book of things like, Oh, put chickens under fruit trees. That'll just work out. Well, and then you realize, well, but if the fruit trees are young and they go roost and they break the branches down, it's not such a good idea. There's a lot of, it depends on everything, <laughs> um, you know, to not focus on strategies above principles. Cause it's easy. Everyone wants prescriptions. Everyone wants their herb spiral or their rice patty or whatever it is, which might be a really bad idea for, for where you are. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I just think the overall work involved, I think there's a, is just a mystique and a, a general sense. I don't know really where I got it originally, or other people seem to keep getting it of like the designers, the one in the recliner, you know, and that it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, I have some amazing fruit trees sometimes that will just drop a ton of fruit without any work in the last five years, but then they're not valuable, that valuable, unless you extend that harvest to the eight months a year, 10 months a year where there's no fruit coming yeah. from that tree. And that's who's putting up the fruit, you know, who's turning that into cider, who's turning that into yeah. whatever else. And, and that's the, you know, that ongoing work input um, is such a reality um, that I think any good old homesteader kind of doesn't harbor illusions about, but in permaculture, there's a lot of illusions harbored about. I mean, also maybe it comes from a warmer climate where there may be yields all, all year long, where I live in a climate where that's just not the case too. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, that's a big part of it is the cold. It's like, we live in a climate where for six months of the year, you're just trying to keep shit out like from freezing to death. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're just living on your stores. And yeah. Yeah. And that is ex totally different than where a lot of like modern permaculture concepts emerged for sure. Yeah. Um, and I could see that. I, mean, I was just actually down in, in Mexico recently and, you know, I, I was only there at one point, but you could see like how easy it could be to just walk around and harvest stuff and barely need, you don't need any clothes, but you don't need many, <laughs> even socially. <laughs> and there's just nothing you, you need so little compared to here. And um, so it is, it is an interesting and, and kind of maybe logical sense that emerged for that. But I'd say that's a big one. Um, and just also the, 
the uh, succession of spaces, you know, that even with shrubs and even some trees, like we're starting to see the, the end of our plum grove, like our plums, plums are short lived as far as yielding well as far as I, I can tell. And some of our nice plums that were amazing for a bunch of years are, are no longer um, doing well. And it's like, okay, what's next in that spot? Like it's easy to not think and design and the succession to things yeah. that seem pretty permanent, like a tree. Yeah. Cause some trees like peaches and plums, they're, they're not very long lived. Seaberry like to the thicket. They actually, is, the single seaberry isn't really a long lived thing at all. Yeah. Um, and so some of these things that you think, oh, there's a tree, I'm like, that place is done, you know, I've got it planted. <laughs> and uh, when you start to get into the, towards the third decade, you realize, oh no, you know, what's next there? Um, yeah, and, and just also arriving at species that really thrive on a harsh site, you know, for us, that's that's been challenging. Prunus as a whole are not happy there. I mean, and also that there's a there's a quite a bit of a honeymoon period on sites. Like after a while, the pests figure out what's there. I feel like in the first five years, you can do a lot. You can get away with a lot of things in the first five years on a site that you can't in the next five. Interesting. And so you would accept yeah. that I've heard that same thing. Like we don't have greenhouses on our farm, but I've, I've heard this, that, that same phrase, there's a honeymoon period in greenhouses that lasts yeah. like three years, but I've never heard I, it. Uh, attributed to a site. I think that, yeah, I think there isn't definitely for sure greenhouses. I've experienced that and gardens for sure because the pests start coming in and then even just the site as a whole. No, there's some benefits like obviously, you know, some walnut, our walnuts didn't start bearing to like year 10 and now they're bearing every year. Yeah. So some things improve are better every year, but some things kind of start getting worse after about year five to eight and just stay kind of challenging definitely pest wise is what I found. Okay. Although to, to be fair, there's some pest situations that just aren't bad because of the diversity, I think, which is yeah. cool. Cause you see, I have, I've compared certain yields of certain things. I can't think of what they are off the top of my head with other people who like really grow a lot of that or don't have a, a lot of the diversity and they get like where the pest is like a n annoyance for us, or maybe mo somewhat problematic just can be like, is like super destructive for like the other site. Yeah. Um, so I have experienced that too. Like potato beetles, for instance, like we'll get them in general, like I barely have to do anything and they're not a problem. Whereas, you know, they really, really are a problem for a lot of people. Um, I don't know if that's an overall diversity thing, but probably it might be. Um, yeah. But yeah, there, there's a lot especially like the rice is a good example. I and mean, we had no, you make a patty out of you earthwork, a new patty. There isn't, there ain't no weeds in that patty. <laughs> your first year of rice, it's an annual crop. It's going to be yeah. uncompeted. Yeah. Give it three years and you have like, you know, wetland weeds can be like super hardcore. Yeah. So, and the birds, like the, the rice is a great example. The birds found out about it. Once the birds found out about it, then you have to net it. And then you're like, killing frogs and toads and birds in the netting and like i hate net you know netting yeah. just sucks so yeah. yeah yeah no that's that's interesting the, the um uh really the only kind of two things that we've had past issues with is uh one has been like cabbage moths mm. and that's just because we live in like canola country I and mean, it's a brass mm. so there's literally like you know tens of thousands of acres of canola right next to us and there's there's i cannot grow cabbages like there's nothing yeah there's, there's no point so we've switched to like kohlrabi and stuff and they're on yeah but the other one that really surprised me was um uh we get cedar wax wings here uh mm. we probably get them down there too we do uh, but um they uh they love uh honeyberries or hascaps they have made my hascap crop just i don't even deal yeah. with it anymore but like it's it's amazing like I've, I've never seen a cedar wax wing in my life like before, yeah. and like the first year I had Hascat berries, they just came out of nowhere. Yeah. And, uh, and like, it was just nuts. Like just dozens. Oh yeah. I yeah. joke that I, the cedar waxwing species, they owe me a lot of like, like, <laughs> like I got their back. Like they might want to come help me at some point if I need a hand, because I fed 95 to 99% of, we have a lot of honeyberries at our second site and they've taken almost everyone every year for years now. Interesting. 
it's that, like yeah <laughs> one thing i started to, like they were really bad in the early years like uh i put some in about six years ago but now what i've noticed is they they um and i've also heard this from like a couple of my clients they're actually commercial house cap growers and they say it's like they only like on a if you're doing like a several acre block you know you're not going to get any house from like the outside two rows but they don't tend to go inside oh interesting kind if of you that. have that you have that yeah, if it's, wow. if, it's a, if it's a monoculture like that, but yeah. I've actually noticed because I don't do any pruning or anything on mine, but um, they uh, they even tend to do that like on like the bigger bushes. They only get like the outside stuff, right? But right. they don't migrate kind of inside to the really, mm. um, heavy stuff. But the, yeah, they, that's interesting. In the early years, they took everything because the bushes were just small. But now that they're bigger, it actually hasn't yeah. been much of a problem. Yeah, that's been I'd say the one of the biggest pl- things. One of the things we planted at a decent scale like many dozens yeah. that has been pretty disappointing partly because the cedar wax wings but also because for, for i feel like the the when they're really good is a pretty short window like yeah they're like oh these are okay and then you get a really ripe one and you're like oh that's pretty good <laughs> um but it's yeah. not and, very just, and then they just fall to the ground <laughs> yeah so like i definitely haven't planted any more of them and i, I haven't really been ex- i mean we'll eat them they're, they're cool they seem very long-lived and they're yeah in the ground and and here but yeah between that and the wax wings we do they are really right around our deck a bunch of honey bears and they will i'll watch them if my cat's not out there or i don't go out they'll they'll burrow right into the big bushes for us they because we don't i mean maybe we don't have we have some big rows further away but they'll god i feel like if i was away they'd get every single one even into the big bushes but and then they're gone i don't see any wax wings like a week or two after they're gone like the wax things aren't even here yeah yeah well they have started to overwinter here actually they're they've been living off of, we have uh, uh crab apples like some oh. Siberian crab and uh so they've been kind of they made it through this winter the wow whole year long, but that's uh, amazing because you're cold i mean you must be as might even be a zone colder than us yeah we're we're like three three a three b like we get, we get, we yeah, get minus, easily then yeah minus I mean, I 40 for uh at least a week or two every year oh wow yeah you're way colder because all i know edmonton's freezing cold yeah it's it's yeah wow yeah you're brutally cold we're not that i mean (laughs) i almost feel like we're more like zone five now i mean yeah not we're not the zone i think the zone um metric is kind of poor we're we're colder than the zonal metric like leads on because our annual low isn't that bad but our average low is pretty cold yeah yeah, no, that, and that makes sense. Yeah, because you're you're just so um, there's so much tree cover there, and it's such a wet climate. Yeah, and in the mountains, but yeah. but from a zonal standpoint, we're at least a zone and a half warmer than you guys are. Yeah, yeah, because like our growing season is basically like our like frost free is like May fifteenth to uh, September fifteenth for us. Right, which is very similar to us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 you get colder like way colder for sure for longer it sounds like but but one we had a historically cold winter a handful of winters ago and the average temperature in january was two fahrenheit which is like i don't know negative 20 something maybe yeah celsius and uh was only four in february and it never got above freezing for like 100 days and so that that killed like all our quint our quince died never came back never even root sprouted Wow. Our um, medlar died, done, never came back. And then a bunch of gummies and stuff died to the ground. A bunch of stuff died to the ground and came back. Yeah. And that was just the average, you know, that it was the average low that really did it. Yeah. And th- that's been a big kind of wake up for me is just like how, you know, uh, in the early years, I was, I would definitely plant it outside of my zones uh, in a lot more. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's more like, I think planting below your zone is a good idea and maybe like a little bit of the fringe stuff, but yeah, it's, it's really shitty when, um, you know, you get one, one, like last year I had, you know, several hundred cherry plums die back to the ground hundred percent and, wow. um, you know, they were six years old. It's like, I, so it's really, sets you back. But, but again, that's where like having that diversity is, is, um, you can't put all your, like they're, they actually came back really well. They didn't, it didn't kill, oh, cool. mm-hmm. but, um, yeah do you get so your your ability to grow nut trees is pretty tough like what what's the nut trees in that zone uh so we we have some native hazelnuts 
Yeah. I, I've seen like two on my farm in the, in the forests. Uh, and like in our neighboring provinces, like in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, there's native bur oak. Um, and so th- th- we, um, uh, they're not considered native here, but we, we do plant them and, and they do yeah. quite well. They're super hardy and they, you know, after even you know four years, they're already producing nuts and they're quite, wow. Wow. Um, huh. but they're super slow growing. Like it's, uh, although there's, um, there's a, this amazing nursery that, um, I traveled to in, um, it's called purple Springs in BC. And they had a, they had, they were, they're growing this like new, um, uh, they're, they're pioneering kind of uh, this new nursery uh, project, which is like kind of not using any synthetics and, and only using, you know, cover crops and compost teas and like just all biologicals and, and like root pruning and just like basically trying to, un- trying to understand what happens in like native for or natural forests and then mimic, mimicking that in the nursery is really mm-hmm. uh, interesting, but they were growing, mm-hmm. they had bur oaks that were like 12 feet tall and they were like three or four years old. Wow. Which is like, it was unbelievable to see the size of these things. And it was just purely through, um, you know, like root pruning at strategic times of the year to, um, mm. you know, mimic something in the forest. And it was, yeah. Far out. But wow. Was, that was a big eye opener in terms of like how, because I have, I have 10 year old bur oaks that are, <laughs> you know, smaller than their four year old ones. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. For us, bur oak will, after it's established, if it's happy can really put on growth like two to three feet a year but it's slow in the beginning yeah yeah kind of like black walnut but it never goes quite as fast black walnut for us will really put on growth after a few few years yeah see i've got a couple black walnuts here that um like they haven't winter killed even like even in the year where i lost all my cherry plums we had we had we had below minus 40 for like two weeks straight (gasps) And uh, the, the black walnuts, they didn't, they didn't die, but they really haven't grown at all in the oh, interesting. years that they've been here. So it's, it's uh-huh. mainly, mainly like the bur oak. I actually have some of Mark Shepard's hazelnuts on the farm here as well, but they, cool. they haven't done much. They, they kind of winter kill um, quite a bit every year. And so they're like, they're yeah. suffering sideways, but they're not really getting, you know. Yeah. We're, yeah. Zone three is tough for your what? we're a berry climate here that's yeah that's my yeah insight. it's like we can grow like there's 12 different kinds of berries on our farm and right um that's actually one of the things i was going to ask you is have you ever um grown uh silver buffalo berry yeah i did i grew up one in zone one early on and then i moved to veg- i made that area veggie garden i kind of cut it down and i never replanted it but it got huge quickly okay and did you get any berries off it or was it a male? No, I don't recall okay. getting any berries. The, the, so like silver buffalo berry, it's a native um, in our area. And it's yeah. it's a, almost identical to sea buckthorn. And we've got kind of both on our farm. Yeah. But the, uh, in my opinion, like I love sea buckthorn, but buffalo berry blows it out of the water. Wow. Um, yeah, I'd like to plant them again. Shepardia, right? Yeah, uh, Shepardia uh, argentia. You, you don't yeah. want the can the canadensis one is like soapberry and it's it's garbage. But the it's okay. the, if it has thorns, like it's if you grow like you know seabuck thorn and 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 silver buffalo berry side by side, you it, you can't really distinguish them unless they're you see the fruit on the trees. One's red. Oh one's wow. Orange. But yeah, I, I remember it looking a bit like a sea berry. A little, you know, quite yeah. close. Yeah. Yeah, but the um the uh one of my buddies he uh because they they grow them a lot in the cities here because they're they're salt tolerant so they grow them on the sides of roads right right salt doesn't kill them but uh we found this one in the city and it literally like no lie it tastes like mangoes wow um because like there's there's some like they go from like bright red to uh almost white like and like in a lot of orange ones and so like it's just an amazing um like the flavor is, is like, you can, you can grab a handful and just throw them in your, in your mouth. Whereas like sea buckthorn, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's just super yeah. intense. Right. Wow. That's cool. I'll have to try those again. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's great inspiration. Yeah. I mean, they, they definitely, and they're ultra hardy. Like you say, if you can crank it in your climb and they're, yeah, they're like a plain hardcore wind and cold. Yeah. Hardy. Yeah, I, I would say they they do even better in our climate than the the sea buckthorn. Right? Again, yeah, they're, they're native, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The sea buckthorn are not. I don't think they are what a lot of people say. They. I mean, I, I don't see them as very drought tolerant, even though people say they are. Yeah, and 
they're not I don't they're not very vigorous early on either is what no. I find as for a nitrogen fixer they're kind of need a lot of coddling early on is what I find yeah I would uh I've had a real difficulty it's more so um like the nursery stock I found is really difficult to get good sea buckthorn nursery stock um mm -hmm. and that's made all the difference because we used to have like a, a you know provincial run you know tree program here and uh and those trees like you you could put sea buckthorn in the ground and just walk away and they'd be awesome but mm. now they they shut that down and they're just kind of private ones and um i can't get one to grow for the life of me now wow yeah <clears throat> interesting yeah they they maybe try from seed uh, i mean they can be real vigorous but then you know you have a seedling versus like a nice fatter fruit yeah yeah but the, and they're starting to come up with cultivars here that uh that are available um cool like Indi i think indian summer is one that's uh i think we've got a couple hundred coming right out. yeah i've seen some of those canadian cultivars in richter's catalog yeah 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 here on go here on gold or here on sunset and yeah yeah we've tried some of those they haven't been do taken off too much for us but they're also in a tough spot yeah and have you um uh have you ever used the tea for lee for uh so the leaves for tea or anything like that a little not much no no because um, that's been um actually a major um a major because when we harvest i cut the whole branches and i freeze them yeah. in the deep freeze yeah. and clip them off and then winnow it and um i think it's one of the nicest teas uh we do the same thing for for canada buff or the silver buffalo berry but the sea box yeah just, it's like it's like green tea without the shitty aftertaste like it's huh. just, cool it's just i'll it, have to i'll have to try it again i kind of one time maybe made a little tea but yeah i haven't been earnest about it because the what i found is when you take the um like when you uh when you put it in the freezer and you hit it with a stick and like you know all the leaves and berries fall off and you're winnowing it all this kind of the smaller kind of junk berries they fly out with the leaves yeah and so I, i'm left with like really pure kind of good berries and then um, i don't pick through to get the other ones i just take a rolling pin and just crush them and so there's actually bear, the the berries mixed in with the leaves makes like a really nice fruity, um, you know, energetic tea. It's just, it's amazing. We, um, we sell a lot of it here on the farm. And cool. I, know, like, I don't know, like 30 bucks an ounce or something we're getting, which is what the going rated is on. You, know, you can yeah. buy it on Amazon and wow. uh, it's, it's just an amazing uh, yeah. product That's for us. That's great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good to hear. I mean, they definitely have so much foliage, you know, even yeah. on a poor and the foliage is more reliable than the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially because like for the males, you know, you don't get any fruit off those. Right. And so that's like, I'll, I'll, um, I still prune my males. Cause like I found when you, like we have them in rows and if you only cut the females, you end up with, with these males are just enormous. And so yeah, finding some way to kind of put them to productive uses has been. Yeah. Been yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Do you have any pollination issues with your sea berry? Not really, no. Um, no. I, we uh, most of ours are in kind of like shelter belt rows, and so there's a, mm -hmm. a lot of them. And from what I've heard, it's like if you have one male to every seven females, because they're they're wind pollinated, as far right? As I can tell. I yeah. have seen bees in them, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have, we haven't had any issues. Yeah, oh, that's good to hear. Sometimes yeah. I feel like my males and females are not synced up. Oh, okay. No, I've, we've, uh, I mean, they're probably one of the most reliable berries on our farm. Like, like a yeah, lot of yeah. be hit and miss from year to year, but um, like every year you can kind of count on them. That's cool. Yeah. That's for us. I used to feel that way about them. Now I don't. And I feel like black currants for sure about that. That, that they're more reliable. Yeah. Yeah. They're Interesting. Nothing, it's nothing. it's yeah. the, op like for me, the black currants are, um, they're up and down, but my red currants. Wow. Is, are really huh? good. yeah yeah the reds are pretty reliable for us but the birds tend to get them but um okay but the black yeah black currants are in and aronia are in their own category for us like you'll definitely have them every year and they're easy to harvest and they, uh, no one else takes them they you just get them yeah yeah I, we uh we don't have any aronia here i've actually never eaten one of the berries it's well i bet they they might be worth there because they're pretty hardy yeah, that's I've I've see, seen them, but they're they're uh, hard to get um, nursery stock for in our area. For uh, but, huh? Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. 
Well, one of the things that you uh, you mentioned earlier was like uh, kind of heading back into the dark ages, and it, it reminded me. Um, uh, you're a big fan of James C. Scott. I noticed you've got a whole uh, YouTube playlist of him. On. Yeah, that's great. You've seen that. I've wondered <laughs> if anyone notices that that, that those playlists. <laughs> yeah, and um, so I mean, like for folks who haven't heard of of uh, James C. Scott, can you just kind of give a bit of a introduction to him and why people should pay attention to him? Yeah, well, I think he's just um, just done a great um, cataloging and kind of overview of like societies that um are much more egalitarian than what we're used to even seeing as an option in our study of history and also pre um like grain societies and societies that are not so centralized and um yeah i mean yeah just kind of like like essentially like more like egalitarian kind of like permaculture societies really yeah yeah, I mean the uh, I've only read one of his books, Against the Grain, and mm. uh, the thing that blew me away was his 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 argument that um, like taxation isn't possible unless you have an annual kind of grain based agriculture, because you know if, if you're growing root crops or if you've got you know kind of grazing animals or things that are you know ephemeral, you know the tax collector can't just come by, you know, during a wide window and say, okay, you know, I see your crop now, this is how much grain I expect from you, you know, after harvest. It's, you know, you can't do that with potatoes because, you know, everything's under the ground and it's, it's hard to just walk by a field and kind of give estimates. And that just really blew me away. It's just like how, um, you know, the, the, this, the, you know, imperialism and, and kind of the state are really tied together you know bed mm -hmm. of uh, of annual agriculture mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure yeah that's interesting that that reminds me of uh the whole chestnut culture in in corsica and how it was illegal you know it's legal connections and how it was illegal uh, for a while to grow chestnuts because it was considered a weapon because the, the people could have food without work. <laughs> Interesting. I've, I've heard the same argument for, um, uh, there's a great book called um, Lesser Beasts. Mm. It's about mm. pigs. Mm. And uh, Mark Essig is his, uh, is his name, the author. And uh, he, he, uh, he makes the argument that the reason why uh, pork was kind of banned almost universally in a lot of the world's religions was for the same reason is that it kind of gave people independence and the mm. ability to be separate from, you know, kind of the state and the, you know, the religious institutions mm. uh, as opposed to, cause he, he kind of goes through all the other theories, like, you know, the reason that pork was, was taboo was because of, you know, parasites or, you know, all the other kind of classical things. And he, he feels that the strongest argument is that it was a, a way of controlling people was to mm. legal. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> I haven't thought about that. I thought about those pigs. Pigs are something I haven't really spent much time with for sure. No, I, they're, um, I mean, the, and, and Bill Mollison said a pig is just a garbage can with legs. <laughs> like they're just, they're so, uh, they're like a fast composting system. You can just throw kind of anything at them and, and they convert it into, um, you know, high quality protein and fat in just a yeah. incredibly short amount of time. They, they used yeah. to call them the mortgage lifters uh, huh. because they're just, they were so profitable. Yeah. Like there's, there's people in my area that, you know, would sell uh, in one year, they would raise, you know, enough pigs to basically pay for an entire house, like to build and, and complete it off of one, one wow. batch of a small homestead. Cause they were just so profitable. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. That's cool. Um, but like going back to the, the James C. Scott thing is like the, the, the thing that I, uh, it was, it's funny because I, I read his book a couple of years ago. And when I saw this playlist the other day, uh, on your, your, uh, your YouTube channel, it got me thinking, cause like, I've been, I've been, you know, I'm not, I'm not depressed or anything about, you know, the state of the world right now or what's, you know, like I'm, I'm concerned. And, and obviously there's, you know, some, some pretty terrifying stuff that's going on, but it reminded me of one of the things that he said is like, you know, when we think back to like the dark ages, you know, that are portrayed in history as these like really awful times, 
um, uh, James talks about how they, they were only awful for like the aristocrats, mm. and the bureaucrats. It's like, like for, for like the average person, you know, the, the so-called dark ages, actually the quality of life kind of lifted um, mm. during those periods. And that it was really only, yeah, the, you know, the higher kind of upper echelons of society. And so it just kind of gave me, I was like, oh yeah, I, you know, one more thing why I shouldn't be so worried about the shit that's happening in the world mm. <laughs> world today mm-hmm. is that, <clears throat> you know, it, it has happened before and, and. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting that, that like bumps, bumps might be worse for the, for like the elite class or for the state itself than the, than the people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Cause, yeah. cause it's easy to think, it's easy to see why it's the opposite can be true too, that those that like the commoners f- often suffer the most. Like look, if you look at this pandemic, it's like, you know, the, yes. the elites are doing better than they were and the, <laughs> the average person doing worse, you know, but it's also a pretty short bump so far. Yeah. Like still propped up by fake money and all this stuff that isn't very permanent. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that was his, um, his point is basically like, you know, you've heard the saying, you know, you know, history is written by the kind of the winners. Right. And, or it's like, but it's also it's like history is written by the scribes and the, you know, the aristocracy. And so like, you know, when they, the times that they thought were really, really bad, if you were to look at, you know, the, the, the lay people, it was actually pretty. And I mean, that's, I also know, like, like, I also know people who have been living in cities right now and like, they haven't left their apartment you know, for a part to, you know, go to work and, and come back for this entire time. Mm-hmm. And I just, I can't imagine that. But yeah. like, for me, it's like, if I didn't listen to the news, I wouldn't know any of this stuff was going on. Right. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> nothing's, nothing's changed for me. It's like, we just, right. Do our thing. And so I can kind of see right. how, I mean, we've, we've never lived in, we've also let, never lived in a time where there's been less, you know, common people in terms of like peasants on the land Uh, and so that might be the thing that is different now is you know if if there is some kind of a you know collapse scenario um it's not like everybody already knows how to garden and it's just that they're right the the state is going to take less of the the you know the the grain as their as their levy it's it could be worse Mm -hmm. yeah totally that's interesting Hmm. i don't know what are your um what are your thoughts on kind of the, what's your prognosis for, for the next year? <laughs> I honestly have no idea. I mean, I, I think, I think significant, I think we're, it's volatile and I think we, things could just kind of trend right back to um, not normal. Cause I think, I think you can't go back to, I think there's tra- too much trauma. It's just like, I think, uh, I think nine 11 is the only example yeah uh for this like we, we yeah. had this acute event and then like the corporate state apparatus utilized it for gaining for gains yes and then you know the whole security theater and the all the biggest companies that do all that stuff and then they kind of kept a lot of that going even still it's 20 years later and that's all you know yeah. a lot of the stuff in the airports and everything and the, the patriot act and you know, you still can't go film in a in a factory farm in the United States. It's considered an act of terrorism. That's all from that. And that's yeah, all. Yeah. You know, once you put laws on the books, they don't really come off the books too easily. No. So, you know, this is like 9-11 times like a thousand, you know, in, in yeah. m- most ways, it seems so. So uh, whether we go back to like what looks kind of normal, the way people are like living um, soon or not, I think there will be a lot of things that just stay with us and people are quite traumatized. And I think the social distancing thing is like super scary that that's became normal and and now might be hard for people to go back or, um, or, and conversely, um, it might be stoked by, you know, these variants that keep emerging and, we might be pressure what we are doing might pressure this virus to make uh really hardcore variants and and pressure the organism or the process at work to to get worse instead of better which usually viruses get a lot better yeah um and less less deadly 
so I don't know. I think it's all on the table, but I, I think, um, I think we stretched a lot of things thin and we've just failed. Like we've just failed way harder than we were failing, you know, as a species and for real health, for real resilience, for real wealth, for like, yeah, real stability. Like we just made it, we just added like a layer to the ocean with of masks, you know, like, like we already like trashing the place and now we just did it in a different way because of our own fear of, of dying ourselves. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know though. I mean, you really, really don't know what it's going to look like in six months or a year. Yeah. Do I you, wouldn't even really guess in some ways. Yeah. Do you, um, do you spend much time, you know, thinking about it or is it, is it just kind of more just. Yeah. What's been your personal. Um, I try to, but I, I, I just tend to, to not, um, I talk with my wife a lot about like more like just how it's going to affect us personally with like just the way like laws are changing and the way yeah. social climates changing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just makes me, you know, do my own, you know, um, resilience in my own life. And for my community, it makes me want to, you know, I- I've taken it on more seriously than I was before. I was kind of coasting before. And then when this happened, like, I put up extra wood for neighbors, you know, like last during the pandemic, when it rolled in, I was like splitting wood, like right now, last year is when I do a lot of my wood processing. And when it became apparent, things were going to get really weird. I was like, I'm just going to put up a shit ton of firewood because like someone might need it. You know, I'm not going to need all this, but like someone will. And I actually gave a third of the, of a cord of really dry wood dried for a year away the other day to a neighbor. Um, and I just kind of want to do all that kind of stuff more and more, just kind of like focus on the community resiliency piece because our needs are pretty well taken care of. I mean, you know, it's all relative, but our yeah. needs are infinitely more better taken care of than, than most folks. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, the whole political and social trauma that that's been inflicted this year is, <laughs> I don't know. It's good. It could go to really weird places. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the, uh, I honestly feel like it's like, I should, I should be more concerned than I am, but I can, right. like, you know, like uh, we also live in it. Like we're pretty well set up here as well. And, and that's kind of my process is just like, we, you know, we have, um, you know, let's just get up as much of the kind of resources that would be useful together, just in case, like my, my general philosophy is like, okay, what are the things that I can do that benefit me no matter what? And it's just like, just focus on that. Cause it's right. If you spend too much time on the, uh, you know, how shitty things could get or how shitty they are. It's just, it, it's self, it's self-defeating, right? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's, it's easy to go way down the rabbit hole and, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll think about that. I was like, oh, so like there are still these like whatever, 7,000 like nuclear warheads. And like, it takes like almost none of those to go off to just like totally make like the COVID thing seem like a good day. <laughs> and like, and then it's like, okay, but really all I can do is this and this, and that's not that much. And so let's just not think about it <laughs> Yeah, because there's nothing I'm going to do about it. I'm you no. know, writing a letter to the Pentagon's not going to change anything. (laughs) Like there's literally no, I have no sphere of influence on that, you know? Oh, exactly. The, it's funny you say about the, the nuclear thing. Um, I was listening to a a podcast. This is a couple of years ago that uh, Brett, um, Brett Weinstein did. I think it was on Mm. Joe Rogan or something. And he was talking about how um, a collapse isn't an option. You know, because like there is kind of a I, I do catch myself. It's wanting kind of the system to just crumble and just you know so that we can you know come back from the ashes. But mm-hmm. he, he had this interesting argument, which was like collapse is is not an option because we we've gone through kind of the progress trap of nuclear power plants. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and like if if one of them like they're they're kind of spaced close enough to each other around the globe that if kind of more than a few of them go off it sets off a chain reaction it's like it's game over mm-hmm. so he's like like the, the 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 systems that have enabled that like need to kind of maintain at least in some level because if it gets too rocky and you know the backup power systems fail 
you know, it's game over. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never heard someone talk about that, but I've thought about that exact thing myself. And, and that is a big reason why I, why I started to check myself when I'm like, yeah, what we need is it all to fall apart <laughs> because yeah, that, that comes to mind since I, I, I thought of that at one point is like, well, I think Fukushima made that pretty clear. It's like, oh yeah. If the grid's down everywhere, the generators aren't going to run very long and all 104 nuclear plants in the U S are just going to kind of do a Fuku yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, Although I'm not sure how true that's a topic into itself, but I, I think um, they, they will have problems, but I don't know if they'll be as bad. Like it, it, it's hard to tell how quite how bad they would be. Yeah. Um, like it might be better than them running for a lot longer, but yeah, it's, it's I'm more compelled by the, um, I think Charles Eisenstein addressed that topic of like in some interview, he was like, collapse the idea of like collapse. We need collapse to happen because we need to rebuild better. He's like, there's really no good reason to think we'll rebuild better, though. No. And and that's kind of a, <laughs> a, a, a you know a startling idea of like it's easy to think, well, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be worse than this. It's like ecocidal society is like, but but really, there are a lot of really bad versions, and and this could be not as bad <laughs> as, as it could be, and uh, that's a, a, yeah, that's kind of an arresting idea. Yeah. Well, and I think it's just you know it brings a bit of humility to the whole thing. It's just like, you know, these are complex issues and, and um, you know, and this, it comes back to kind of permaculture, which is like the prime directive is just, you know, kind of don't, don't criticize the world, start in your own backyard and scale up from there because right. if you try to do it from the top down, you're probably going to make a worse <laughs> mess of it than, mm -hmm. than already is. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes that s sounds like kind of a, you know, a, a a defeatist or a, um, you know, too, too small of a thing, but I don't know, the more that I get into it, it's, it's just like, I, I don't know, I don't know how to fix these problems, but I'm going to start mm. with the stuff that's, you know, in my own backyard. And, um, and it, yeah. it, at least to get like the, one of the things that I've, um, I've been thinking a lot about is just like, okay, like if, if, if I could like had a crystal ball and I could know, you know, into the future that everything that I was doing right now wouldn't matter. And, and, the, and that there was, there was nothing else that I could have done to make any difference. It's like, would I still do what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. like, absolutely. Like there's nothing, right. there's, there's almost nothing I would change. And to me, like, that's the litmus test for it's like, how, like, how do you want to live your life? Um, and obviously like you, if there is anything that you could do that would make it better, you would want to do that. But um mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm like, I'm super grateful that, that, uh, you know, the lifestyle that I have to live and, and, and one of the things that I really appreciate about like the work that you've done in your, in your book is just how well, like there's like every page of your book just oozes well being. It's just like, this is, mm. this is how good life can be. Um, and, and, you know, on all your Instagram posts and stuff like that, whether it's, you know, you skiing or, you know, you know, skinny dip it into a, a, a pool or something like that. It's just like, it's just, uh, it really comes across. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's, it's, it's really att attractive to people um, mm -hmm. because like no one wants to join your revolution if it sucks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's gotta be, you're just living, you know, living better. And what's that like that, uh, Edward Abbey thing of like, you know, you're just, you're going to outlive the damn bastards, you know, <laughs> and don't, don't make your life so shitty fighting that, that yeah. you're not going to like outlive them and, or live better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, live more, live more vitally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And it, it, I feel like it's easy to do here where I live and, you know, um, but man some places it's harder <laughs> like it in the is. cities i think it is yeah i i would not want to be in a city right now but <clears throat> yeah yeah for sure but uh so anyways ben thank you so much for for taking the time to sit down and chat it was it's yeah it's, it's been an honor to you know finally meet you screen to screen here and hope yeah to face to face at some point definitely uh, yeah love to get out to that zone yeah do you, do you ever come up to canada there's really good you know, skiing here. Oh yeah, I, ha I have spent time in BC a little bit, and 
Ontario, a um, little bit in Quebec, but no, way more for sure. Yeah. I would like to spend way more time, um, especially in BC. Yeah. It's, it's BC is a beautiful province. And, but if, if you've never been to the, the plains, um, it's, it's pretty good too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool to hear. Cause that seems like a pretty hardcore place all in all. <laughs> I, it is, it isn't a, in a lot of ways, but it's like the, um, I don't know. It's, you know, it's like everything is just, you know, the, like we have just an amazing ecosystem for animals. It's like, that's our, yeah. that's our chestnut here. It's just right. Big grazing animals that can yeah dig through yeah. a foot of snow and get grass all winter. And wow. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's cool. Actually, this guy who I'm visiting me right now is Bob, this guy, Bob Quinn, who has 4,000. He kind of started the Camu ancient grain initiative. Oh yeah. That's his, that's his farm. He, he's here right now at oh, visiting cool. and, um, and he's just really in your in the similar bioregion to you. I mean, he's plains of Montana and it's cold and yeah, it's yeah. probably maybe a little more mild than you and maybe drier. It's like 12 inches of rain, but yeah, it's amazing what he can do in that yeah. seemingly very harsh place. Yeah. Uh, that's about the same as us. Like, you know, Montana's just, yeah. just um, South of us, but uh, right. we get about 12 inches of rain and, and uh, that's yeah. so arid. I mean, we're 50 here. I know it's like the, the <laughs> 50% of our precipitation comes in snow. Right. And so that's our kind of major, uh, like our major water harvesting event. Like there's, there's been four times in living memory and I'm, I'm fifth generation in this area. There's been four times in the living memory of our family where we've had more rainfall than the soils could absorb Four rain wow. runoff events. Everything else hmm. is basically it's, we got to capture all the snow melt when it comes that's wild that's it. Huh. yeah it's definitely so different here we, <laughs> our swales become chinampas pretty regularly oh yeah yeah like no, I, just standing water my swales are filled once from rain that's it wow huh. for two weeks in the spring in the spring melt they're full yeah yeah that's cool nice well keep up the great work thanks for the shepardia inspiration too i gotta get back on that kick yeah, uh, no, no problem. I, uh, I've, I think I've quite a few uh, more inspirations I'd have to give you before we were even. <laughs> sure. Hey, well, um, we've got time ahead. Yeah. So, um, just before we go, Ben, where um, uh, uh, it sounds like you're doing a lot of uh, you know online consulting right now for for folks. Mm -hmm. Where can folks go to learn more about that? Yeah, just my website. If you go to wholesystemsdesign.com, um, there's a page about that. Yeah. And uh, I'll try to email you back. Um, <laughs> email me twice if you don't hear back. I'm just swamped. And we were away too. And so yeah. email is swamped these days. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm scheduling them not too far in advance. In advance. And yeah, and there's some updates on that. I've got a newsletter now that I'm going to finally try to keep up with. And that you can sign up that on that website. But I'm not on, uh, well, I'm not on Instagram. I used to be on a lot and posting a lot of updates and I'm just trying to be on that a lot less. So, yeah, uh, I have, I have one um, request for you. Uh, is there any way uh, with this new book that you're going to put out that you can get it read uh, for, um, for audiobooks? Oh, I haven't asked the publisher, but that's a great idea. Um, I know like, uh, yeah. me, like I've, I've got a copy of your book, but, um, my, oh, cool. my style of learning is, is very much auditory and, yeah. uh, uh, it would be, I would buy, f f f I'd be your first person to buy it for sure. And cool. we're actually, we're getting ours read through our publisher mm -hmm. as well. That's coming out. And, uh, you might want to check with yours because apparently there's, there's grants and stuff that you can get to make books kind of accessible for, um, uh, for, mm. basically for people who, who can't read. Right. Right. Um, and so it was super cheap. It was like a few thousand bucks to get our book read and it's the same wow. length as yours. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That's a great idea. It hasn't come up as a topic, but I'm sure that they might be very interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. No, I'm the same way. I mean, I can be like in my wood shop listening to a book and like, I don't have less and less time that I want to sit down and read a I book. Know. So yeah. I'm the same way. At this rate, I won't be reading anything and 10, 20 years. <laughs> I mean, kind of joke, but kind of true in some ways. Yeah. So anyways, uh, thank you again so much for your time and all that you do, Ben. Until next yeah, time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be in touch. <laughs>